Hello to the second part of chapter 54 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Town Hose Story. And I'll continue from where I stopped the last time with Ishmael telling the story of the town hall. It was not more than a day or two at the furthest, after pointing her prow for her island haven, that the town hose leak seemed again increasing, but only so as to require an hour or more at the pumps every day. You must know that in a settled and civilized ocean like our Atlantic, for example, some skippers think little of pumping their whole way across it, though of a still Sleepy night should the officer of the deck happen to forget his duty in that respect. The probability would be that he and his shipmates would never again remember it on account of all hands gently subsiding to the bottom. Nor in the solitary and savage seas far from you to the westward, gentlemen, is it altogether unusual for ships to keep clanging at their pump handles in full chorus even for a voyage of considerable length, that is, if it lie along a tolerably accessible coast, or if any other reasonable retreat is afforded them. It is only when a leaky vessel is in some very out-of-the-way part of those waters, some really landless latitude, that her captain begins to feel a little anxious. Much this way had it been with the town hole, so when her leak was found gaining once more, there was in truth some small concern manifested by several of her company, especially by Radney, the mate. He commanded the upper sails to be well hoisted, sheeted home anew, and every way expanded to the breeze. Now, this Radney, I suppose, was a little of a coward, and as little inclined to any sort of nervous apprehensiveness touching his own person as any fearless, unthinking creature on land or on sea that you can conveniently imagine, gentlemen. Therefore, when he betrayed his imagined solicitude about the safety of the ship, some of the seamen declared that it was only on account of his being a part owner in her. So, when they were working that evening at the pumps, there was on his head no small gamesomeness slyly going on among them as they stood with their feet continually overflowed by the rippling clear water, clear as any mountain spring. Gentlemen, that bubbling from the pumps ran across the deck and poured itself out in steady spouts at the lee scupper holes. Now, as you well know, it is not seldom the case in this conventional world of ours watery or otherwise, that when a person placed in command over his fellow men finds one of them to be very significantly his superior in general pride of manhood, straightway against that man he conceives an unconquerable dislike and bitterness, and if he had a chance he will pull down and pulverize that subaltern's tower and make a little heap of dust of it. Be his conceit of mine as it may, gentlemen, at all events, steel kilt was a tall and noble animal, with a head like a Roman, and a flowing golden beard, like the tasseled housings of your last viceroy's snorting charger, and a brain, and a heart, and a soul in him, gentlemen, which had made steel kilt Charlemont had he been born son to Charlemagne's father. But Radney, the mate, was ugly as a mule, yet as hardy, as stubborn, as malicious, he did not love Steelkilt, and Steelkilt knew it. Espying the mate drawing near as he was toiling at the pump with the rest, the lakeman affected not to notice him, but unawed went on with his gay banterings. Aye, aye, my merry lads, it's a lively leak, this. Hold a canakin, one of ye, and let's have a taste. By the Lord, it's worth bottling. I'll tell you what, men, old Rad's investment must go for it. He had best cut away his part of the hull and tow it home. 
The fact is, boys, that Swordfish only began the job. He's come back again with a gang of ship carpenters, sawfish and filefish and what not, and the whole posse of them are now hard at work, cutting and slashing at the bottom, making improvements, I suppose. If old Rad were here now, I'd tell him to jump overboard and scatter him. They're playing the devil with his estate, I can tell him. But he's a simple old soul, Rad, and a beauty too. Boys, they say the rest of his property is invested in looking glasses. I wonder if he'd give a poor devil like me the model of his nose. Damn your eyes! What's that pump stopping for? roared Radney, pretending not to have heard the sailors talk. Thunder away with it! Aye, aye, sir, said Steelkilt, merry as a cricket. Lively, boys, lively now. And with that the pump clanged like fifty fire engines and the men tossed their hats off to it and ere long that peculiar gasping of the lungs was heard which denotes the fullest tension of life's utmost energies. Quitting the pump at last with the rest of his band, the lakeman went forward all panting and set himself down on the windlass, his face fiery red, his eyes bloodshot and wiping the profuse sweat from his brow. Now, what cozening fiend it was, gentlemen, that possessed Radney to meddle with such a man in that corporeally exasperated state? I know not, but so it happened. Intolerably striding along the deck, the mate commanded him to get a broom and sweep down the planks and also a shovel and remove some offensive matters consequent upon allowing a pig to run at large. Now, gentlemen, sweeping a ship's deck at sea is a piece of household work which in all times but raging gales is regularly attended to every evening. It has been known to be done in the case of ships actually foundering at the time. Such, gentlemen, is the inflexibility of sea usages and the instinctive love of neatness in seamen, some of whom would not willingly drown without first washing their faces. But in all vessels, this broom business is the prescriptive province of the boys, if boys there be aboard. Besides, it was the stronger man in the town hall that had been divided into gangs, taking turns at the pumps and being the most athletic seaman of them all. Steelkilt had been regularly assigned captain of one of the gangs. Consequently, he should have been freed from any trivial business not connected with truly nautical duties, such being the case with his comrades. I mention all these particulars so that you may understand exactly how this affair stood between the two men. But there was more than this. The order about the shovel was almost as plainly meant to sting and insult Steelkilt as though Ratney had spat in his face. Any man who has gone sailor in a whale ship will understand this and all this and doubtless much more. The lakeman fully comprehended when the mate uttered his command. But as he sat still for a moment and as he steadfastly looked into the mate's malignant eye and perceived the stacks of powder casks heaped up in him and the slow match silently burning along towards them, as he instinctively saw all this, that strange forbearance and unwillingness to stir up the deeper passionateness in any already ireful being a uh, repugnance most felt, when felt at all by really valiant men even when aggrieved, this nameless phantom feeling, gentlemen, stole over Steelkilt. Therefore, in his ordinary tone, only a little broken by the bodily exhaustion he was temporarily in, he answered him, saying that sweeping the deck was not his business and he would not do it. And then, without at all alluding to the shovel, he pointed 
to the three lads as the com customary sweepers, who, not being billeted at the pumps, had done little or nothing at all day, little or nothing all day. To this, Radney replied with an oath in a most domineering and outrageous manner, unconditionally reiterating his command, meanwhile advancing upon the still-seated lakeman, with an uplifted copper's club hammer, which he had snatched from a cask nearby. Heated and irritated as he was by his spasmodic toil at the pumps for all his first nameless feeling of forbearance, the sweating steel kilt could but ill brook this bearing in the mate, but somehow still smothering the conflagration within him without speaking, he remained doggedly rooted to his seat till, at last, the incensed Radney shocked the hammer within a few inches of his face, furiously commanding him to do his bidding. Steelkit rose, and slowly retreating round the windlass, steadily followed by the mate with his menacing hammer, deliberately repeated his intention not to obey. Seeing, however, that his forbearance had not the slightest effect, by an awful and unspeakable imitation with his twisted hand he warned off the foolish and infatuated man. But it was to no purpose, and in this way the two went once slowly round the windlass, when resolving at last no longer to retreat, bethinking him that he had now forborne as much as comported, comported with his humour the lakeman paused on the hatches and thus spoke to the officer. And what he said, that's what we will hear the next time. Bye-bye. This one's for today. See you soon.